Hey, you guys, I am so excited for my next guest. You know her. You love her. It's the nanny. It's Fran Drescher. She's on the show today. She's a Golden Globe nominated, Emmy nominated, best selling author. She's a philanthropist and she's a health advocate. And today she's here talking about cancer schmancer. She's also going to give us some behind the scenes uh, information that happened at the nanny. And, of course, she's going to talk about her style secrets. Stay tuned. She's coming up right now. Well, I am so excited. I have got Fran Drescher on the show today. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Everybody knows you. You are an Emmy-nominated, Golden Globe-nominated. You're a philanthropist, a health advocate, and a best-selling author. I mean... It goes on and on and on. And you've got a Shayna Punham. You're so cute. If people don't know what that means, it means a, a very cute face. Um, so I just, uh, I'm so excited to uh, have you on the show. And um, we're going to talk about your organization, which is Cancer Schmancer. So um, thanks so much for being here. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And I appreciate your support. Well, I, um, you know, my show, we talk all about fashion and we talk about all different kinds of shows and entertainment and celebrity stuff. And, um, but I always like to give my audience a little bit of background on you because everybody, of course, knows you for the nanny. Uh, but I wondered, like, you know, growing up in Queens, like, who was Fran Dresser? Were, were you like like a, a popular girl? Were you like, you know, were you like a cheerleader? Were you kind of a quiet girl growing up? What were you like? Well, I, I was never a cheerleader. I was always either <laughs> in the drama class or, you know, being helpful to in volunteer jobs with the vice principal or something. Um, at one point, I... I, I was part of a program where I'd go after school to um, a, a senior center. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I always had aspirations to become a professional actress. So as I entered high school, you know, I entered the Miss New York Teenager pageant and I started trying to get an agent, trying to get professional pictures and all that stuff. And I was in a special program in high school that was uh, for theater careers. And so I went for half a day taking different theater courses. And so I really kind of had my eye on the prize uh, quite early on, probably by the time I was in middle school. I deduced that out of all the things that I enjoyed, Uh, This sort of felt like the most fun, the least like work, um, the easiest for me. And so I decided to pursue acting. Wow. And so then after you did that, did you go on to college and then pursue it there? Or how did that? I, uh, I went to college, but I didn't even last a full year because my professional career started to take off and... The school that I went to um, didn't really offer freshmen's um, theater classes. You had to wait until you were like a junior or a senior. And that seemed like a long way off. And I already knew I wanted to be an actress and I was already starting to work as an actress. So I dropped out of college to pursue beauty culture school, so I would have something to fall back on that was something else that I enjoyed doing. And I thought, you know, if the acting didn't work out, I had ambitions for, you know, becoming like the next Vidal and Beverly Sassoon. Really? Wow. You would do, Did you actually do hair? Yeah, I still do hair. Oh, you still do it? Yeah, I just gave my dad a great haircut. My mom said, no one cuts his hair as good as you do. Oh, um, who would have known that you still cut hair? Yeah, I'm good at it. I like You're- it. I probably oh. would have specialized in doing men's men's hair because I do like cutting men's hair. But um, 
But yeah, I put in a thousand hours. I went to Altissima Beauty Institute. Oh, that's so funny. Wow. That's so interesting. So you're licensed. You're, yeah, you can do it. That's amazing. And then what happened? Then you decided, then your career started taking off after that. Yes, I got that small part in Saturday Night Fever when I was um, still in school and working part time at a, on Saturdays at a um, beauty salon in Brooklyn. And once I got Saturday Night Fever after that, I was flown out to California by the same studio uh, to do American Hot Wax. And that was it. I came out to do American Hot Wax and I just never went back. And I started wow. working as an actress. So I never really fully realized a career as a uh, beautician, but uh, I did cut a lot of my friends' heads at the time <laughs> who were also kind of just starting their careers like David Caruso and um, Dennis Quaid mm. and Dan Aykroyd. I used to cut all their hair. Wow. So you're a celebrity hairstylist. Yes, literally. <laughs> <laughs> um, if people don't know, you were in the scene with John Travolta on Saturday Night Fever and you were dancing with him in that famous scene. That yeah, was, well, I came yeah. over to where he was sitting with his brother, who he brought to the 2000 Club. And uh, and uh, I, I say that line, are you as good a bet as you are on the dance floor? <laughs> right, right, right. As a matter of fact, that line I said to him on a Golden Globe red carpet when we were both next to each other being interviewed by different people on the press line, and I walked over to him and said that, and you know he knew, who, of course, who I was and wow. why I was saying that. That's amazing. It's like that really spearheaded your career. The it Saturday did. Night Fever. It yeah. absolutely did. I mean, I had only done some commercials prior to that, and uh, that was my first speaking part. And after that, I got this other movie playing opposite Jay Leno called American Hot Wax. And that's what um, brought me out to L.A. Wow. Were you always funny growing up? Uh, you know, the dressers are kind of funny. And <laughs> I, I'm, I don't know if, I don't know, but I, I know that I was always like kind of a problem solver. And uh, I was always a leader within the pack of friends and always kind of there at, you know, the, with the popular kids. Uh, but I was kind of a homebody too, and I really liked hanging out with my parents. So it wasn't like I had to be out of the house all the time. I really, I really didn't. And yeah. uh, when I got into high school, I, you know, I had a boyfriend and then we broke up and then I, I started becoming friends with Peter who by the end of high school, you know, he and I were kind of a couple. And by the time we were 21, we were wed. That's amazing, so young, wow. Too young, really, too young. Yeah, but yeah. Um, it's so, I, and I know like, um, I mean, obviously about the show and how the show came about and everything. And I just, I wanna ask you about that, but I also wanna ask about who do you, who were, when you were, growing up and as you were coming into your career, who did you look up to as a role model? Well, I think I learned a lot from watching I Love Lucy reruns. That was one of my favorite shows and it was on every day. Mm -hmm. uh, so I watched it all the time and mm -hmm. I really loved it from when I was very, very small. Um, and, you know, you know, my mom always had a lot of street smarts and wisdom. And so I learned a lot from her. Um, and then eventually when I came out here to do that movie, I was 19, about to turn 20. And that was when I met my, uh, ma my manager who became like a surrogate second mom to me and a great influence in my life as an adult. And uh, so 
I would say, you know, Lucy, my mom, and Elaine. Your man is is it still your manager today? You know, she dropped dead going out to lunch once after Boy. 38 years of oh. representing me. Oh. And uh, it was really tragic. I never saw her I'm alive sure. again. Fortunately, I, I happened to see her two days before, and oh. I took a little video of her and her husband. But, uh, you know, life gets in the way sometimes. Yeah, wow. So she mentored, she, she kind of gave you guidance when you were here. Yeah, she was a, you know, very stylish woman, very, uh, you know, she, she, she was a great entertainer. She threw great parties. She was an art collector. She was a world-class traveler. And all of that rubbed off on me. Did she teach you about fashion, kind of? Or was that, in, was that you? I always had uh, my own sense of style. Back in Queens, I, I didn't really dress like the other kids. I was influenced like um, from Audrey Hepburn and stuff mm. growing up. But I think that, uh, you know, other things, uh, I mean, she did, she did have a lot of style, Elaine. And uh, so I, I don't know, probably a little bit. Yeah, but maybe a little bit of your own. I think more in own. the uh, area of art collecting, of um, getting to know yourself in therapy of traveling, of okay. entertaining, all of that were, you know, and, and also the way she handled my career. You know, I often bring her up with my current representation because uh, she was really an illegal haram. Like what did she do that was so different? She regarded me as her blue chip stock. Um, she said, I'm never going to lose money on my investment in you. Mm -hmm. And she didn't. No, she didn't. And um, just in the way, uh, the expectation that she had of how other people dealt with me and knew how special I was, how uniquely different I was. She always used to say, with you, it's either a fast pass or a quick yes. And the more talented people say yes quickly. It really goes to show like, when you find somebody that truly believes in you, right? Well, you know, the first thing is to believe in yourself. Yeah. And then to find, if you're really lucky, I was very blessed to find someone that believed in me as much as she did. And were you always kind of growing up, did you always kind of have that self-esteem about you believing in yourself? I think so. You know, coming from a family where my parents definitely were very loving people, very supportive, and uh, very loving with each other, too. So that was, you know, a, a good foundation for me. Um, you know, they just, my mom once said to me, you know, you don't need to take typing because you're going to have a secretary. Oh, you're going to have one. Wow. So I grew up feeling kind of confident that I was special. And then I was lucky enough to meet Elaine, who also, you know, absolutely thought I was a star long before I literally was one. But you had that self-confidence in beginning, which is, is very important. I think that's a great point that you make. Like you have the confidence first and that transitions to other people too. Yes. I mean, you know, when I go up on an audition, if I didn't get it, I sincerely thought they made a mistake. <laughs> that really? they, they didn't know what they were doing. And wow. uh, that was why ultimately I manifested the opportunity to become the boss because I really was getting tired working for people that I didn't think was as talented as I was. And I remember the last pilot that I did that I said, never again. I'm not gonna just take any piece of crap because it might get picked up and I'll be stuck doing it. And I, I really am uncomfortable 
with mediocrity in my art, in my craft. So, you know, for a long time, I just did my own things. And then the last series that I did, once again, I kind of was working for somebody else. And, you know, it was a good experience because I love the people I was working with, but it was also a good reminder that uh, I really have to produce my own shows and be the star of them. And uh, I was relieved when it didn't get picked up. Wow, that's, that's so interesting. So you knew right away that you wanted to maybe have your own. Well, after I did that lousy pilot, Mm -hmm. And I, I was working a lot. I was always doing pilots and things. But that last one, I said, that that's the last one I'll do for the money or whatever. I, I You know, I'm either going to get on the inside in a very significant way within the next five years or I'm getting out because there's other ways I can make money. And so tell the audience how you got, how the nanny came about. Well, within those five years... I uh, did a short-lived series for CBS called Princesses with uh, Twiggy and Julie Haggerty. That only mm -hmm. lasted, I think we did uh, eight or nine or ten episodes and only seven aired and they pulled it. And uh, then I did a pilot for CBS that was a like a like a spoof on night on soap operas, but it was a nighttime show. And that didn't get picked up either. So my girlfriend said that she was going to her country house in the south of France, and did I want to join her? And I thought, well, I just did a series. I just did a summer replacement pilot. Pilot season is over. I'm not going to work again for a couple of months. So I'm going to cash in my frequent flyer miles on TWA and join her. And wouldn't you know, on the plane ride to France was the president of CBS. Did you know it was him when you saw him? Yes, yes. Oh, you knew? Yeah, because yeah. I had already just worked for the network twice, oh. re very recently. Right. So I recognized him. He had kind of a distinctive look anyway. And I said, Jeff, and he said, Fran, and then I ran into the bathroom to put some makeup on. <laughs> <laughs> Just one minute. Yeah, while yeah. I'm powdering my face, I'm thinking carpe diem. This is like, this is an opportunity. And, you know, carpe diem is seize the day. Yeah. And, you know, he was a captive audience because where was he going to go, coach? Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, I knew that this was a great shot at convincing him that I should be given my own show and I should, you know, write and produce it. And nine and a half hours later, I kid you not. Nine and a half, wow. Yeah, we yeah. flew all the way to sure. Europe. And uh, he said, okay, look, when we, when you get back, call my office and I'll set you up a pitch meeting with comedy development. And I... You know, I was so over the moon. I said, thank you. You're not going to regret this. I didn't even have the idea. Oh, nothing. Uh, Peter and I were writing a, something, but that was not the nanny. And uh -huh. uh, when I ended up leaving my friend in the south of France and joining Twiggy in London, I was touring London with her little 12-year-old daughter, uh -huh. And the kid all of a sudden said, oh, Fran, my new shoes are hurting me. And I'm thinking, what's she telling me for? <laughs> Fix it yourself. Yeah. I thought, you know, I hope she doesn't want me to take her home because I'm not ready yet. <laughs> I said to her, oh, honey, just step on the backs of them. And she asked innocently, won't that break them? And I said, break them in. <laughs> well, I couldn't get this relationship out of my head because I wasn't telling her what was good for her. I was telling her what was good for me. Right. And so in the middle of the night, London time, it was like eight hours earlier in L.A. I called Peter and I said, 
I think I thought of an idea for the series that we should pitch. Jeff, what do you think about a spin on The Sound of Music, only instead of Julie Andrews, I come to the door? And he only thought for a second, and he has a very good sense of these things, and he said, that's it. As soon as you get home, we'll develop it, and that's what we'll pitch to CBS. And that's what we did. We walked into development and I gave them that one liner and he walked into Jeff's office and said, Frank Drescher is the nanny from hell. Unbeknownst to us, they were looking for eight o'clock family shows. And that was the beginning. He, he, he said sold right away and green lighted the project. Wow. Did you only come in with one idea? Yes, that was it. We knew just that. that. Just that. That was it. And That's we didn't amazing. even know they were looking for family shows. We just knew that fish out of water, and it was so easy to pitch because it's kind of the sound of music, only instead of Julie Andrews, it's me. <laughs> right. It really kind of says it all. Right, right. And the That's handsome amazing. widower father, I mean, they bought it right on the spot. That's amazing. Kind of like what your manager said. They, it's a fast yes or a or a fast no. pass. Exactly. Wow. And then you got to be so known for the fashion on the show. Correct. Well, Peter and I, you know, instinctively knew that I was the type of a star that has wardrobe and can carry it. And I always believe that television is a visual media. And uh, it's a small screen and it has to, you know, make a big statement. Mm -hmm. So uh, we definitely wanted the nanny to uh, put on a fashion show in every episode. And in fact, we designed that staircase to give her her own runway. Right, wow. And one of the, um, the second in command in the costume department of princesses, she wasn't the head customer, but I, I really responded to her. I thought she was brilliant. And I told Peter, if ever we're in a position to hire a costume designer, we should get Brenda Cooper. So that was, you know, she, me, and Peter kind of conceived the look of the nanny. Wow. But then you also work with designer, right? She worked with the designers to get looks or did she create the looks? No, no. Uh, she would uh, shop the looks with all the up and coming designers of the day from Moschino, Dolce & Gabbana, Todd Oldham. I, oh, yeah. I wore a lot of those designers and she would often make adjustments to the original design, either making the shirts shorter or right. adding a detail or changing the buttons. And everything was picked to um, f complement the story or a joke. Uh, she was very good about reading the script and matching the right costume for that scene. And, uh, and she was very good at also building your body from the undergarments out. So you mm -hmm. looked your best. Um, but she did work closely with uh, the designers of the day and uh, rarely, if you know, ever actually did a design. But um, that look and how uh, the color palettes, how all the other people in the same scene complemented each other, all of that was uh, Brenda. What was your favorite look from the show? I know it's like, it was six years, it was a lot of show. I mean, was there like a look that you were like, oh my God, I can't believe, because you did fun things with feathers and stones and all different. Well, I always enjoyed when I'd wear like a gorgeous evening gown that really showed off my figure. That was always fun. The mini dresses and mini skirts and hot pants was oh, yeah. a lot of a lot of fun. And then she'd always find these great pieces. It would be a fantastic vest 
or it would be thigh-high boots, or it would be a hip chain-link belt. And it all kind of came together. And you know, the important thing was that the character never looked slutty. No, right. There was a sweetness to her, even though she was sexy. Kind of like you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Don't you think? Yes, well, I, I was always self-described as the hooker with the heart of gold in many of my <laughs> parts. Really? Yeah, in the early days when I was doing small parts, very often I'd be like either, you know, I don't know, like a hooker or the uh, fast girl in, in, in school or... And, oh, wow. but it was, but I never played it that way. I always played her where she was really um, adorable and, and funny. You loved her. Funny. Yeah, right, right. And I what can't is... really get away with playing an unlikable character. The audience is disappointed. I know. It's so funny when I told people, oh, I'm going to be inter um, interviewing Fran Drescher. The common response everybody always says everybody that i said it to i love her <laughs> they so always say that nobody's like ah not her <laughs> everybody's like i love her like that's the common you were just a, a lovable character yeah and you know i think over the years subsequent to the series um you know i've 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 offered myself honestly and nakedly to the fans in a very real and authentic way I've shared things that have happened to my in my life uh, that were very painful. I go to the mat for uh, those that are marginalized. Mm -hmm. I started my own nonprofit. I've written two New York Times bestsellers and a children's book. I made a law in Washington uh, that was passed in the Senate by unanimous consent. And then I was appointed public diplomacy envoy for the U.S. State Department, which is a vetted position that took me all over the world to our allied nations and military, talking about health and how we have to take control of our bodies and choose what we bring into the home, what we eat, all of our personal care items, what we clean and garden with, uh, make much more mindful choices because it's all that stuff that is compromising our immune system and, and uh, increasing our risk of getting all kinds of diseases. So uh, I think that over the years, I've gained, a, I, I've developed a relationship with my fandom that uh, goes beyond the character. The character mm -hmm. continues to be very beloved. We're now on mm -hmm. HBO Max, yeah, so people right. can st stream it with no commercials. I'm watching it again. Peter's watching I it again. I watched it. Yeah, I just watched it a couple nights ago. You get all the seasons. Yeah. Yes, and it's really good without the commercials. It's just so enjoyable to watch. And you could just watch what you could cherry pick whatever ones you want to watch. So. Uh, everybody's really enjoying that, and it's, I think, you know, even more popular now on HBO Max than it was back in right. the day on CBS. Yeah, It's yeah. more appreciated now that the public has had time to catch up to some of the things that we were doing. And a lot of the millennials now that were children then, you know, missed a lot of the humor a lot of the double entendres, a lot of the gay humor, the Jewish humor. And yeah. so that's all now. And, and of course, the clothes. And, uh, you know, we're doing the Nanny the musical now. I heard about that, too. You're in the process of writing that, right? Yes. Or is it written? Uh, Peter and I are constantly doing rewrites as more people step into the collective. So... You know, we started with a producer, and now after the producer, we got Rachel Bloom from Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Oh, yes. And she's right, writing right. the lyrics. Uh-huh. Then we got our director, Mark Bruni, who directed Beautiful on Broadway. Mm -hmm. Now we're in search of a composer. But, you know, the thing about this form of entertainment, musical theater... Uh, it's really a collective art form, and so good for us that we have that kind of experience uh, through working for, 
writing and television, because that's very right. collective too. But it does take a very long time also. And so we were very blessed in the sense that uh, we were able to continue working on it, even though Broadway was shut down, unfortunately, through this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And tragically, we lost our composer to the virus, so. Oh my God. Yes, Adam Schlesinger. Oh, oh wow. So now that's why we're, you know, we've been yeah. doing rewrites and, and Rachel's been writing songs, lyrics, and so now, you know, we're ready to uh, try and, you know, entice uh, an excellent uh, composer. When, when would it come out, the Broadway musical? Well, I don't really know. It's not, I don't have a lot of experience doing this, right. but I've already been given a schedule that's through the rest of 2021, advancing it to a place where we actually have a cast mm. and we could workshop it. Right. After workshopping it, I guess you do out of town. Oh, right, right, to, to get it all worked out. So maybe like in a year or so. Yes, I, I would say yeah. within the next two years seems yeah. realistic. So people can look forward to that, yes. It's going to be amazing adding music to the nanny. I mean, do you, like when people listen, they always love to know like little tips. Do you have any, when you were dressing for the nanny, did you have any style tips that you're like, I always did this? We would just, sometimes we would take a very sexy, like, spaghetti strap mini dress and turn it into a jumper and put a turtleneck mm. under it. Oh, and that became a very unique look that nobody else was doing in the day. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, the character had very big hair. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, right. and that was kind of a lot of fun. I was always checking my lipstick and so much so that we put it into the character that, you know, she would often look in the mirror and do this and right. go on her way. Right. That's <laughs> interesting. I always like when people, you know, sometimes they like to know like how much of, you know, your style secrets are things that, you know, undergarments are always important, you know, having the right fit and all of that with clothes are always so important. Yeah, having the right size bra, the right kind of stockings and right. undergarments were yeah. very important for shaping and smoothing. Accessories too, I never, we never really over accessorized. It always seemed like it was too much very quickly. You mm -hmm. know, uh, earrings, necklaces, there wasn't a whole lot of that. It was more of a clean look, you know. Uh, Brenda likes a clean look. And finding the right shoe that was flattering on my leg, that mm -hmm. elongated the uh, silhouette was really important to us. It was a, a complete look because hair, makeup, accessories, and then the clothes had to not only complement each other, but complement the script. Right, right. Um, it's so much, I mean, you are so honest, I feel like, with your fans. I mean, you're, you're so open and, and I want to talk about the cancer schmancer because I think it's such an important thing that you're doing. And I looked on the website and I watched the videos and all of those things, I think, which is so key. And I just, uh, one of the things I think that uh, you were very open about is things you went through with some of the trauma that happened early on. Um, and then of course the cancer, you know, and one of my main questions is like, did that, did that trauma, did that happen before the nanny? Yes, it happened in my uh, 20s. Uh, I think I was around 25-ish, 26, something like that. And uh, that was when I was a victim of a violent crime in my own right. home by right. a stranger who was on parole. Oh. Oh. Um, and uh, I was still in the place in my own 
of development psychologically where I didn't really allow myself to get too into feeling my feelings. I just sort of picked myself up, dusted myself off and pushed my feelings out of the way and just continued on. But of course, you know, I now know that they don't really go anywhere but deep inside. And I feel like having done that, it contributed to why I ended up getting cancer like 10 years later, or being diagnosed with cancer like 10 years later. Over the course of those, you know, 10 or 12 years, um, Peter and I had had a painful separation and I had started uh, therapy. Mm -hmm. And so I learned that how to feel my feelings instead of pushing them away. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, when I got diagnosed with the cancer, I thought, you know, I'm not gonna handle this pain like I did the last one. I, I've spent too much money on therapy to do that. Yeah. And I yeah. really have to approach it from a different point of view by means of feeling my fear, feeling my pain, asking for help, being vulnerable, all of that that I was unable to do uh, after the breaking, but not but for the cancer, I did do it. And uh, so, you know, in a way, the universe gave me another opportunity to learn an invaluable life lesson. Wow. Uh, you know, you gotta really, yeah, you gotta really put yourself in the equation of your own life. Mm -hmm. And you gotta, be able to ask for help, not just give help. Right. You were more of a giver? Yes, I, I was more comfortable giving than receiving. And that's actually very narcissistic, you know? You, you deprive people the joy of giving to you. Mm. You only want to give to them. Mm. And uh, I think I was just never comfortable with it. And I'm, I, I, I think I traced it back to you know, incidences that happened in early childhood, but, you know, it's time to let it go. Kids mm -hmm. come up with ideas about how they have to be. Uh, and uh, at some point you gotta unravel that and then decide, is this still working for me? No? Okay, well then I gotta change my behavior. But it, it, is it that easy? It doesn't, it's not always that easy, right? It, it, well, it's, it's never easy. Yeah, right, to just go, okay, gonna, I wish I could do that. Like, I'm going to change my behavior. Then I, like, fall back into it again. First of all, the, becoming aware of it is the yeah. first big giant step. Then sure. behavior modification is the journey. Yeah. And it's, yeah. Always, and it's always challenging. I mean, growth is painful. That's why they call yeah. it growing pains. Right. But, right. you know, and I always tell people, I mean, if you uh, slip up and two weeks later you realize, oh, I shouldn't have said that, I should have said this, revisit it. Yeah. I, I, I would call my father up and say, you know, remember when I said this? That was not in keeping with my therapy. What I really should have said was this. Oh, and yeah. eventually you fuse together and you're able to say the things that you know you're supposed to say on, uh, for your own best interest in the moment. Right, right. It, you replace a bad habit with a good habit. So after that traumatic event happened, then you got the nanny, were you in your 30s or late 20s? I was 34 when we shot the pilot. Oh, oh wow, 34. And you just kind of pushed through that whole time from the incident to doing the show, that, those 10 years. Yes, I mean, honestly, I thought that it was behind me, but when uh, the show was a success, there was one of those tabloid shows on TV that did a whole expose on the fact that I, you know, was raped at gunpoint and they even tried to visit the assailant in prison. I was already in therapy because my marriage was falling apart and then I had post-traumatic stress from revisiting it okay. that way so publicly. Right. Uh, and I was with a good therapist at that point, so I really had to go over it and unravel it all, all over. And, uh, 
And so, you know, I did that, but um, I, my body was already working on a cancer inside me. And when I started to get symptoms, it took me two years and eight doctors to get a proper diagnosis of uterine cancer. So I got in the stirrups more times than Django. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you think it does? I mean, that it's like that's really good. I think for people to hear that, like when something does happen, you need to deal with it. You need to get it out of your body. Yeah. Right? Otherwise, it's I mean, gonna, it's gonna become toxic. It's it right. doesn't go away. Right. You know, you're better off right. just feeling it and getting to the other side as quickly as possible. And, you know, I was just speaking today to the celebrated grief expert, uh, Dr. David Kessler. Mm -hmm. And he said something that was so fascinating to me. He said, you know, most people are trying to run away from their pain. And, you know, their pain is like a mile behind them. And they're always running away from it to avoid feeling it. But buffalo out in the prairie, when a huge storm is coming, they instinctively run towards the storm because they know that they're going to pass through it that much faster. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't even know that as a fact. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And I love that uh, comparison because it's true. You know, when you've got a storm. I mean, let's face it, bad things happen to good people Mm -hmm. and no one leaves this planet unscathed. Mm -hmm. But um, you can't avoid pain. You have to, you have to give, give up to it and feel it. And it'll be painful, but that's the only way you can get to the other side. Right. And maybe to live a healthier life, you know, so that you uh, feel better, you know, physically, mentally, everything, you know. But I know, I think, no, who wants to face it? Because everybody wants to run from it. A whole society is based on feeling good. I want to feel good today, you know. And so everything is immediate. And so it's difficult and, you know, all of that to go back through it. But I think what you're doing, I mean, I'd love for you to just say about Cancer Schmancer, it's coming up. You're doing on the 20th. Yeah, we're doing doing the Fran Jam Music Festival, which streams for free. And it's on several platforms. Of course, you can go to cancerschmancer.org. But you can also go to the Fran Drescher Facebook Live or Cancer Schmancer Facebook Live, and you can find it there as well. And so, um, and I think also the Nanny TV YouTube channel. Oh, good. Okay. And some big names are coming. Cindy Lauper, David Foster, Catherine McPhee, all of them are going to be there. Yes, Jackson Brown and uh, Cynthia Arrivo. Oh, we've wow. got... We've got fantastic talent, and it all streams on those platforms, and it's free, though we really sincerely hope that you will find it in your hearts to make a donation, because that's the reason why we put it together. It's, um, you know, something that's very near and dear to my heart, and I really think that what we do is amazing work because we offer the public opportunities to learn about the causation of what is making us sick as a nation as a family as an individual you owe it to yourself to connect the dots because how you live equals how you feel Mm -hmm. and there's a lot that we bring into the home that is carcinogenic and toxic and it compromises our immune system. And when the immune system weakens, then you become susceptible to other things. Right. So, you know, as we come out of this pandemic, the important thing is to live as cleanly and pristinely as you can, Mm -hmm. and to always be mindful of bolstering your immune system. Mm -hmm. 
That's great. Yeah. If people happen to, they don't, uh, aren't there live, is it going to be broadcast, rebroadcast, or do you have to be live only to see the jam, the Fran jam? I think that it's going to play for about a week subsequent to the initial launch. Okay. So you and can people, catch up with it. Yeah. And then people can go on and you can sign up and actually put your email and get notices on cancerschmancer.org. That's so important. Thank you for mentioning that. Yeah. And that's also free. And we don't bug you, but let me tell you something. You're going to want to know what I'm up to and what you can enjoy. Like we do an annual Masterclass Health Summit, and I curate the most, you know, literally mind-blowing doctors throughout the year that kind of, you know, went to medical school, started practicing, then began to think there's got to be a better way, got woke, and is now dedicating their lives to being more functional medical doctors where they really kind of look at the whole body, not just individual parts, and they Mm -hmm. understand that there are key systems within the body that connect different organs to each other, and you got to know all this stuff. Right. We don't really know. It's so interesting because, funny enough, on a personal note, my cholesterol went up. And I didn't think about anything. And then I went to the doctor and I went to a dietitian. And it's like all this stuff that that I learned, I'm like, I didn't know, you know, about preservatives and all this stuff. I just thought, it's fine. You know, if it's it's got nitrates a little bit, it's no big deal, you know. Well, that's why you probably should sign on too because oh i am yeah you know the thing is people are scratching their heads wondering why there's so much autoimmune stuff why there's so much inflammation well it's because our food is in bed with the chemical industry once industrial farming and ranching uh became the norm uh, the quality of food uh, went down exponentially. And all of those chemicals from GMOs and uh, herbicides and pesticides, uh, they rip tiny holes in our gut. The gut leaks into the body and you end up with inflammation or autoimmune problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just so important to eat cleanly, to buy products, that have an ingredient that may have grown in your grandma's garden. And just everything old is new again. We got to keep it very simple. Right, right. And your Edge of Series I watched online on cancerschmancer.com, I think is great. So people just log on to that, be able to sign up online, and Fran will send you an email and keep you posted on what's going on. Sign up for the Fran Jam, which you're going to be inter- That's you know, on Father's Day. Oh, on Father's Day. That's perfect. June 20th, and it's on at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. Perfect. That's awesome. I am going to, you've been so gracious with your time, Fran. I'm going to ask you one last question, then I'm going to let you go. And I always ask everybody this, what is one thing that you haven't told anybody that you think would help somebody else? You're, when you say I haven't told anybody, because I tend to say a lot, uh, <laughs> you know, and I'd say a lot of things, particularly towards helping people help themselves. Yeah. But I guess, you know, sometimes I I recognize in myself that maybe I'm a little too much of a homebody. Like maybe I have a little, a little touch of uh, agoraphobia or something. I shouldn't really label myself because I've never been uh, diagnosed with that. But I, and my parents like to stay home a lot. So maybe I'm just like them. I don't push myself to leave the house. Mm -hmm. I like people to come over. I like to entertain. I like to take walks. But uh, I I never get cabin fever. I could, like, stay days and weeks on end. In your house. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it is a very airy house with a beautiful outdoor environment and a very big view. So it's not like I get claustrophobic anyway. Right. <laughs> but I do think that I'm, I do have an awareness of it and I do try and push myself to, to be out. yeah, to, to, to pick myself up and, and go out. 
Even yeah. if it's just to go to the mail or to run an errand or something like that, I think it's uh, important. And I think, you know, another thing is sometimes I might scare myself, think, oh my God, is something bad going to happen? And then I actually learned that that could be uh, a self-punishing trigger because maybe I did something that I thought in the back of my head I'm feeling guilty about. So then I'll go mm. for my jugular and scare myself with, oh, yeah. you know, something that scares me. And now I know that. So I'll, then I'll start to think, well, wait a minute. Why am I scaring myself? What happened today that I didn't really cognize, but maybe in my subconscious, I think, mm, was that a cool thing that I did or said? And then I'll revisit it and I'll master the real problem rather than letting me go off on a tangent that isn't really relevant, logical, or helpful in any way. Yeah, I think people can relate to that and they can, people, I mean, I can relate to that. So I know it's like knowing that somebody else goes through it helps, you know. Yeah, everybody. for sure. So a lot of people yeah. look at me and think, you know, I mean, I, I guess it's natural to look at a celebrity and think their life is better than mine. And that's why I like to really be honest about things so that, you know, I can help exemplify that, you know, we all go through stuff, but then we have to choose to get through it and live our life fully and play the hand that's been dealt us as graciously mm. and elegantly as we possibly can. Um, so it's important that people look at me and understand that I'm no different. Uh, the only thing that I'm sharing is that I've pushed myself to get to the other side of it. And that's, I think, the meaning of life is to take what's being presented to you and ask why and how can I grow through this painful experience. And I do that all the time and I practice Buddhism and oh, yeah. I try to make kindness and compassion my compass. That's awesome. Wow, that's fabulous. Not always successful, but yeah. I try to be aware and do better each time I falter. Because to you're err human. is human, to err is human. Right, right, you're human, so you're going to err. Everybody is going to err, so... Well, you have been so gracious, Fran. Everybody needs to go to cancerschmancer.org. Join up for the Fran Jam. It's going to be fun. You're going to be entertained. It's Father's Day. Um, thank you so much, Fran, for joining. And uh, I'm so happy that you came on the show. I appreciate it. Well, if everybody signs up right away, they'll start to get the notices. And then they won't have to worry about forgetting when it's Sunday, June That's 20th. Right. That's right. So you take All care right. and be well. Thank, and thank you, Fran. You. Thank All you. right. See you. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to The Cat's Walk. Make sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app. This has been a production of Evergreen Podcast. A special thank you to executive producer Gerardo Orlando, producer Leah Longbreak, and audio engineer Dave Douglas.